questions to understand the process before you begin to do the surgery. Next talk, please, Brett, when you have time. The one will be on medicine. So I think the next talk on medicine is going to be really, really important, too. Oftentimes, as surgeons, we just jump the gun and say, let's put hair up there. But there's so much out there that we can do to support hair loss that's fundamentally important. And as again, if you're practicing ethical surgery, you must enlighten your patients about this because they don't know about it. And if you don't know about it, you need to do some research on this. So we're going to talk about only the two FDA approved or FDA cleared medications. I have no financial affiliations with either company, uh, which are going to be minoxidil, uh, marketed as Rogaine as a brand, and uh, finasteride, which is marketed as Propecia. Let's talk about Rogaine, it's probably an easier topic. Rogaine or minoxidil comes in 2 and 5%. So what I'm about to tell you is what I tell my patients, essentially. What are the pragmatic things you need to know? So minoxidil is a topical uh, application of a medicine. It's applied once or twice a day. It's advocated twice a day. But I always try to get my patients to understand that, look, if they're not going to be compliant with twice a day, at least consider trying to get at least once a day or once every other day. Something is going to be more effective than nothing. And some of the anecdotal thoughts is that it actually can have a quite a long half-life in the skin, lasting maybe even up to 20 some hours. So it is something that I will always advocate. If you can get in your hair at least once a day, it's great. The 2% is for women. The 5% is for men. The 2% and the 5% both come in a liquid form. The foam, which is marketed as a brand name Rogaine, only at this time comes as a 5% for men. And the benefit of the foam is twofold. One is the fact that it has, doesn't have propylene glycol, so it reduces that 23% incidence of allergic dermatitis down to a very, very low level. So people that have allergic response to the liquid, they can use the foam. Also, it may be a little bit easier to style. So sometimes I advocate, even women, because the 5% can be very effective in women so long as they don't have secondary hair growth um, from that, to use that to stabilize their hairs or help them with their hair loss. Uh, this is for both, as I said, for both genders, uh, the, the minoxidil is, with a 2% for women, 5% for men. It takes about three months for that uh, Rogaine or minoxidil to start being more effective, up to six months, and it all continues to, to be effective. With the minoxidil usage, at about a month, you want to sort of caution your patients, they can see some shedding. And what that is, is the hair is going to be, be being converted into an antigen or growth phase. It also may not occur. Either way, it's normal, so that they don't panic if they see some early shedding. Uh, to take a step back, just to go back, uh, and I just wanted to introduce one thing. A lot of people, I want to take a bird's eye view before I get back into uh, minoxidil a little bit. The, um, a lot of people want to understand how do you incorporate medicine into uh, hair restoration? Is it something that's exclusive, far away from medicine, uh, sorry, exclusive away from surgery? In other words, it's either medicine or surgery, or can they be used together? And they really are very effective, as I mentioned in that slide earlier, with the going from, tel uh, from terminal hairs to, to vellus hairs to zero hairs to capture it early. Because once they go into a full-blown baldness, these medicines are going to be significantly less effective. So especially for that young gentleman that comes to you that's so desperate for a hair transplant where you project forward and you feel like that person may not be a good candidate because he's going to have excessive hair loss over his lifetime and develop an unnatural result as he ages, you may want to have that person, or you not, may want to, you definitely want to counsel the patient on the effectiveness of these medications on the front end. So do they work in lieu of hair restoration? Yes. They help to slow down and regrow hair, but they don't take someone and stop hair loss. It's just like slowing down that train. Do they work in conjunction with hair restoration or hair transplantation? Absolutely. It can make your results look significantly better when you have the addition of these medicines in, in, in play. What is the biggest drawback of these medicines? I think the biggest drawback are not the side effects, is the fact that if you stop taking them over a period of years, you will lose everything that you would have lost during that period of time you're on those medicines. And I think that's something really important to communicate to a potential patient about that. The other thing people ask is, are these medications redundant? Do I, can I just take Propecia? Can I just take or finasteride? Can I just take Minoxidil? And the answer is, yes, obviously you can, but they're synergistic. 
and I, and I like what Amina always says, is like playing a piano with two hands. It's a, it's a great analogy. You, it's, a, it's truly when they work together, they work even better. And they've had studies where patients were on both medications over a period of five years. They stopped one of the medications. They actually dropped a little bit in their loss or had some more loss. And they've had also some people that have been only on one medication where they added the second one and they've had a little bit better regrowth, a little bit better retention. So I always encourage patients if they have the financial, mental, you know, compliant wherewithal to use both medications if possible. So I think those are very, very important things that I want you to emphasize to your patients is that these medicines are important. So if you don't remember everything I told you, at least I've laid the groundwork for you to do some reading on it and some, you know, good established textbooks and really understand what's going on with this. Uh, hopefully that is clear to you. And I welcome any of my colleagues, if I've left any basic stuff out that I need to talk about, please interject. I'm, I'm not offended by that. Uh, finasteride is much more complicated because of all the quote-unquote side effects out there. It's a prescription versus uh, minoxidil, which is over-the-counter. So this is something that I want to delve a little bit deeper into. You see a lot of things on the internet today about permanent sexual side effects. So I want to go into a little bit about that so you have ability to respond to your patients regarding that. Finasteride comes in five milligrams and one milligram. The five milligram dosing is the, what's known as Proscar, and it also can be sold as a generic. As of next year, I know that the Propecia will be going off the patent, and so there probably will be a generic version of that. Um, right now, the one milligram for hair loss is marketed as Propecia. Some of the men go out there and cut the tablets of the five milligrams and two quarters to be cheaper. Um, I'm not here to advocate doing that or not. I don't think this is a commercial talk. This is a scientific one, but I believe that the efficacy can be very similar, if not identical, to uh, marketed one milligram uh, Propecia. The, um, the finasteride is taken orally, uh, with or without food, once a day. And the, it is what, the way it works, it's known as a type 2 DHT blocker. So it blocks the conversion of testosterone over to dihydrotestosterone. The reason for this is that type 2 DHT that's found near scalp follicles actually is the, the inciting agent for male pattern baldness. So if you reduce those levels, you can actually have a higher chance of retaining some of the uh, vellus hairs, converting some of the vellus hairs back to terminals, terminal hairs, slowing down the loss of terminal to vellus hairs. Um, the time frame for Propecia or Finasteride to work is on the order of about 6 to 12 months. It takes longer for it to work. And just like minoxidil, for that first period of 3 to 6 months, there can be a little bit of increased shedding as the hairs start to cycle into an antigen or growth phase. And that may or may not occur. Just something that I think is important to communicate to a patient so they don't panic if they start taking the medicine. And you also have to communicate how long it takes for it to work. It takes a while for it to work. And the Propecia or finasteride is something that is, or it is a prescription, at least in the United States, and I think it's important to communicate to the patient what are the side effects. I do have something from uh, Bob Bernstein, which is a very long consent form, about five or six pages, and I have now all my patients cons consent for it before I give them the prescription. All, and I can send you that if you want via email, or I can give it to Dr. Langston. He can forward that to you. Uh, I, I don't think there's any copyright issues with it, as far as I know. Um, and uh, part of that, that consent form, I'm going to walk you through some of the things that are on the internet as well as some of the things that you need to tell the patient so they know about the side effects before you give them a prescription. First of all, with the prescription, there, it, there can be sexual side effects. The sexual side effects, so that there's not all the hype that's on the internet, by, based on initial published reports, are between, is about 3.8%. And if you contr control that against placebo, which is about 2.1%, you got about 1.5% difference in terms of sexual side effects involving erectile dysfunction, uh, decreased libido, et cetera. There, uh, that's a, it, can there be permanent sexual side effects? I don't know. And the answer is, in short, I don't know. Certainly that's possible. The people that have been on it, there can be even late effects of sexual side effects, but the majority occur in the early phases of tr uh, trial. So I usually give my patients two weeks uh, samples from the company. If they have no problems, I have them start it and just get the prescription filled out. Uh, you buy it in pro packs, which are at three month, and three month blocks, and you get a little discount from the company, I think, at, toward the end of the first year if you continue with it. Um, the Pro Propecia, uh, as I said, is taken by mouth. Uh, it is processed through the liver, so it's something you need to know that. I usually tell my patients with liver dysfunction, and I usually honestly just send it to an internist after the first year so that they can continue the medication and just check liver functions, et cetera. 
It decreases your PSA or prostate-specific antigen by about half, so it's very important for someone in their 50s and onward to really know that, especially if they're having any history of prostate uh, problems or someone that's African-American, maybe even their 40s, something that's important. The uh, uh, other things that can occur, breast tenderness, on the order of maybe a couple percent. I've seen a few patients with that. One thing you need to know is that about 58% of men that continue with Propecia, they actually have their sexual side effects regress. So it's a, something else that you can help patients understand that. And sometimes what I do with my patients too is if they're having mild side effects, is to bring them from once a day to maybe once every other day or once every third day. These are just some little strategies that may be helpful as you counsel a patient. Other things that are more recent that people talk about that you need to know, and I, I have a feeling that you probably should counsel your patients, and in either in a written form or verbal form, is that there are some reports of breast cancer risk, very, very isolated, and I think it's way over hyped potentially, but it's something that I think it's important to communicate. And especially when you're looking at finasteride in women, there is really no statistically significant data that it helps women. There's only been some scattered reports, the Arezzo 2006, that are very uncontrolled studies that show this, but I think that I personally don't use finasteride in women. I think it's, it's in, a, in a litigious society we live in, and the fact that there's really no clear evidence that DHT is a factor in women, you gotta be careful. And especially, as you probably know, if you're in a premenopausal setting, there can be a teratogenic effect in women, um, and that you need, to, you need to know that as well. Sorry, I'm going through a lot, a lot of things, but it's important to just go through some of the basics. There is a potentially a 26% chance reduction in Gleason 6 below uh, prostate cancer if you're taking five milligram dosing, that's a proscar, in men over 55. But there's been some scattered reports in the past that it could actually increase uh, the grade of the tumor. And I think that some of the thoughts of why it increases the grade may simply be because of artifact in the sense that the prostate could be shrunk more and greater identification could be found in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the cancer, but that's unclear, it's unclear. So I usually think it's a, probably a wash in terms of the effect on the prostate long term at the very small dosing. A lot of people ask, can I use a five milligram dosing? And I really believe that uh, based on the studies that one milligram is as effective as anything else. Oh, sorry, I wanna jump around a little bit. The uh, finasteride and minoxidil both work on the entire scalp. The FDA has cleared it for really crown use because a lot of the initial studies have shown that. There's a question, is it, is it efficacious in the frontal scalp? Yes, both medications work, in my opinion, equal to front and back and has been proven through studies. And so what I usually tell my patients with minoxidil is to double or triple the dose that's on the package insert so they can cover the entire scalp from front to back and not just do what's on the package insert for the crown, something I think is important to communicate. So um, what are the side effects? Anything else that I've so much. <laughs> Depression is something else they've been talking about recently in the last year. So you're not gonna remember every catalog of, of things I just told you. It's almost like a package insert I've given you, but I think it's important that you do know these things. Uh, if you don't know these things, you're not communicating these pa to the patients, you're not doing as best a job as you humanly can. Um, the other thing too is just in terms of scalp camouflage, I threw this in here, that topic, derm match, uh, nanogen, there's various types of topical camouflage that can either assist you in medicine, assist you in surgery, and if you just can't quite get the density or they don't have enough donor supply or they don't want surgery, you can use these topical wool magnetic f uh, fibers. You can use a sort of like a uh, paint on the uh, scalp called Dermatch. These are very powerful adjunctive tools to help uh, patients with their search for better camouflage with their scalp. Something we always forget because we talk about finasteride and minoxidil all the time, but I don't want you guys to forget it because I think it's a tool in your armamentarium to help someone. Or someone that has a lot of what's called telogen effluvium or a lot of shock loss that's temporary in nature after a transplant, they may benefit from some uh, camouflage during that setting as well. So there's a lot of indications that can be helpful with the uh, topical products as well. The one thing that Nanage, and I have no financial affiliation with the company, has uh, said is that supposedly there's a locking me mechanism and they, people can swim with it. I don't know if my other experienced colleagues believe that's effective or not, whereas a topic can actually shed if they, there's some rainwater. But I have not had a patient come back to me. I'm trying to ask them, please tell me, does this work or not? And I, I haven't got an answer for that yet. But that's just something that I want you to remember when you're doing a hair restoration, that there are other techniques out there other than just the knife. Um, so that concludes my first two talks. Yes? You just mentioned the timeline. How do you describe your medication and your care 
Oh, great. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I was thinking about it and, and adding that. So this is a very important point. The, uh, the medicines are not just for hair loss, but they also help with uh, limiting postoperative hair shedding, especially in women that are very susceptible to what's called shock loss, where they, ha they have all their untransplanted hairs thin out for a period of several months can be very devastating. So using the medication uh, together with surgery is very effective. What I like to do is, for women in particular, I'm really scared they're going to have a lot of shock loss. So I put them on at least six weeks of minoxidil, if not three months, to help them limit that chance of sh uh, shock. Or if a man has a lot of what's called vellus or miniaturized hairs as a large percentage of those areas, then I may put them on medicine to start first, maybe three to six months, and maybe both of those medications are possible to limit postoperative shedding. Also, for example, if, I, if they're younger and I'm debating whether to do a transplant, um, Again, this is probably an esoteric conversation. I, I may start on medicine for a couple years, see how things progress. Uh, but you always want to be careful doing that because you, you always worry they're going to stop the medicine and then you're going to have, then you're going to be looking at a result that was artificially retained because of the medicine. But it's one of those things that the medicine potentially could bridge you towards surgery, give them maybe a few years on the medicine to see how things stabilize and maybe not progress as much. So th is that... Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you, I mean, I appreciate that. Um, anything else I forgot? There's so much information I want to make sure I presented. Okay. Sam, I'm going to yeah, please. No, when I talk, okay, great. I love that. If, I love that. Perfect. Okay. So my goal here is just to educate you guys, make sure you get the uh, points of safety as much as uh, possible.